is Our Town, West Liberty, Iowa, USA. Yes, this is Our Town. This is the place we have chosen as our home. We work together, play together, and build together. We are united in the common cause of making our town a good place in which to live. Leaders such as Ed Baldwin, who was instrumental in the organization of our new 35-member Lions Club, are valuable in the overall development of our town. Another one of our leading citizens is George Borden, who operates the modern A.L. Dice Lumber Company. George's time and interest is divided between the lumber yard and the fair board, of which he is an active member. The general opinion around our town is that George, with the rest of the board, has done an excellent job in making the fair a complete success. And each year it seems as if the fair has been a greater success than its predecessor. Since agriculture is one of our chief industries, the well-groomed beef cattle, sleek shiny sows and small Shetland ponies take the limelight. If the potential grand champion is fortunate enough to have a small boy as his master, he will usually have a close companion all during fair time. The first fair was organized in 1859 and known as the Cedar County Agricultural Society. It was originally held at the present grounds in September 1872. The fair has been so successful that it has increased from a two-day fair in 1865 to the present four-day extravaganza with night attractions. Good entertainment is the ultimate goal of the fair board. The West Liberty High School Band will entertain when the gates are open on August 25th. Though the band is primarily a concert band, they are also well known as a marching unit. The first concert of the spring season was held on Saturday night, June 13th, under the direction of band leader John Driggs. During the football season, the high school band lends its musical support to our team, and its gay, rousing marches entertain the crowd. The band is busy the year-round, giving out-of-town concerts, plus the contests they enter during the year. No band is complete without two or three pretty majorettes to lead them down the street. As you can see, our band has the best. Here they strut merrily along while the band plays John Philip Sousa's Stars and Stripes Forever. Although the band always rates top billing, the fair offers many other exciting and entertaining events. One of the favorites of fair goers is the annual horse races held on our new racetrack. By the time the horses leave the starting gate, enthusiasm runs high and favorites have been chosen. The jockey is very often the difference between victory and defeat. It is for this reason that most jockeys ride the same horse as long as the animal is racing. Activities such as these make the fair an entertainment must on everyone's calendar. W.C. Anderson and Sons are famous for their Hereford cattle, which have been consistent blue ribbon winners in cattle shows and fairs throughout the United States. Black Angus, such as the ones bred and raised on the Raymond Kyle's farm, are listed among the finest of all show cattle. Kyle's herd bull weighs slightly over 1,500 pounds and has sired many prize-winning cattle. The bloodline will be carried down to future prize cattle. These boys, who have always raised prize-winning animals, are getting their Hereford bulls ready to show at the fair. This litter of pigs will be big enough by fair time to enter it. If they are lucky, they will win a blue ribbon. The George Dean farm was homesteaded in 1899 by his father. George hopes that one day, one of his three sons, or perhaps his only daughter, will take over where he leaves off. Many long hours of back-breaking toil have gone into the development of the soil, but now George is able to reap the reward, for the farm is considered one of the richest in the West Liberty community. When George's father first started farming the land, he probably had no idea that it would one day be used for processing hybrid seed corn for the Feaster Association. 
land used for this purpose must be of unsurpassed fertility. Within the last generation, the Feaster Company has developed new inbred and hybrid seeds, which contribute to a 20 to 25 percent increased yield per acre. These seeds are more durable, are able to withstand adverse weather conditions, and in general, have a greater resistance to damaging insects. Here we see the steens loading the corn to be taken to various farmers to be sold. Each July, Mr. Steen has from 40 to 50 girls to detassel the corn, thus eliminating interpollination and giving a heavier bearing type of corn. In September, the corn is picked and taken to a processing plant where it is sorted, dried, and shelled. It is then stored in these large steel storage bins. Small farmers around West Liberty raise products to provide for their own needs. Each tries to keep a few hogs, cattle, hens, and domesticated fowl. The farm shown here is typical of the many which add to the countryside. Farm children spend hours making friends with fluffy chicks, cuddly ducklings, and other animals. It seems some wild mallards have chosen the Anderson farm on which to nest. A new building for the teaching of all phases of agriculture is being constructed in back of the high school. It is to be large enough to accommodate the many students interested in agricultural training. This is West Liberty's only elementary school. Since its huge consolidation program, the school now serves six districts. Our library has recently taken on a new look. It has been completely redecorated inside and boasts of a new cork floor. New lights to aid the readers have been installed and shiny tables and chairs bid both adults and children welcome. Here in our library we can become a prince in shining armor or a beautiful princess in a golden castle. Public Carnegie Library was built in 1904 through the efforts of former mayor J.E. McIntosh and dedicated on January 12, 1905. Because we believe in progress, we have started a new street improvement project, which includes the paving of old streets and repairs on the new ones. Men have been working on the streets and sidewalks since early spring. It is hoped that by the time fall rolls around, all construction work will have been completed. Our first post office was established in 1838. Our present postmaster, Harry Lewis, has been in office 17 years. We are especially proud of our fire department, since it's made up of townsfolk who have volunteered for the job. All of them are employed elsewhere, and when the fire bell rings, they must leave their work to help fight the fire. As volunteers, they can be proud of their record. 29 seconds to get the trucks rolling. The department has two trucks a 500-gallon pump truck purchased by the city, and a big pressure fog truck, which is owned by the farmers. Improvements such as the ones the Clark Strattons are making helps to make West Liberty a more attractive place. The Mary Kimberly Park and Swimming Pool was purchased by the Kimberly family in 1923 and given to the city of West Liberty. Since that time, Many hundreds of people have enjoyed its beautiful scenery, spacious grounds, and recreational facilities. The pool, 155 feet long and 80 feet wide, is considered one of the finest in the state, accommodating about 300 people. On a big day, as many as 500 people have enjoyed the pool, a non-profit one, in the afternoons and evenings. Many of the adults and children are from surrounding territories. They all come to Mary Kimberly Pool to relax in the cool water and have a real good time. Through careful guidance and under the watchful eyes of the lifeguards, many of the children will become expert swimmers. Surrounding the pool and enhancing its beauty is a park and playground which adds to the children's enjoyment. Our mothers here seem to be having quite a time getting the food on the table quick enough to suit the youngsters. 
a $2,500 grant was allotted to the park in 1925. The money was used to improve the picnic grounds. Today, the park has one of the most completely equipped picnic areas in the entire state. Picnicking is a favorite pastime here in West Liberty, and to do it near the beautiful pool and playground is not only relaxing for the mothers, but fun for the little ones. There is plenty of shade under the tall trees and ample tables and benches for everyone. These things, together with the fine park facilities, make for a very pleasant day. For the children more than for anyone else, the park is a paradise. Wonderful playground equipment like the merry-go-round offers hours of fun to the merry youngsters, and the gay hearts are heavy when it comes time to leave. As this little girl could tell you, there is nothing in the world as wonderful as the day at the park. When bedtime comes, she'll be tired but happy. By tomorrow, she'll be begging mother to pack another picnic lunch and take her back to the park. The art of carving stones is almost as old as man himself, and though the years have made the work easier, it takes an experienced hand to turn out memorial stones such as you see at the Iowa Memorial Company, where each stone is a personal memorial to some loved one. This new type of truck with water connections enables the men to work very rapidly. Oliver Atwood, first white man to be killed by Indians, is buried here in Quaker Cemetery. The owner, Mr. Little, is a skilled stone carver. The inlaid marble floor of this showroom was designed and cut by his workmen. This diamond saw, which Wally Mays is operating, cuts granite to any shape or size. The water keeps the metal of the saw cool. The granite here comes from Bar, Vermont, the largest monumental granite quarry in the world. Imperfections in the granite slabs are revealed during the polishing process. However, polishing eliminates them. Here, Cliff Spinden is cutting a stencil of rubber material. Good lettering, expertly designed and skillfully executed, is highly important. Supplementing their native skill, these artisans utilize every modern mechanical means for fashioning superb monuments. Each stencil must first be carefully cut from rubber. It is then placed on the stone. After remaining there for a short time, the stencil is removed and the monument is then sandblasted. To give real life appearance to the stones, the workmen must be gifted in the art of excellent stone carving. Intricate designs such as those used by the Iowa Memorial Company calls for professional skill and superb workmanship. The tools of the stone carver in days gone by included only the chisel and hammer. Today's stone carving brings into use the compressed air hammer saving hours of labor and producing better engraving. Each stone is taken off the truck by a conveyor and then set with cement on its base. Before being delivered, it has passed a final rigid inspection, assuring the perfect workmanship for which the company is known. The engraver's skill draws admiration from representatives of branches of the Iowa Memorial Company. A few years back, John Rohner opened the Rohner Machine Works, with exactly $300 and lots of promises to the West Liberty Bank. Since that time, the promises have been fulfilled and the business has become a thriving organization. Recently, John has installed three bar lathe machines, which are considered the backbone of the business. We also see an engineering lathe and hand screw machines. The Rohner Machine Works is equipped with every type of machine necessary to the production of high quality parts. The Rohner Machine Works is now machining parts, special drill chucks, aircraft machine gun parts, and power steering pulleys for various companies. Their very first job was to build button sorting machines. Turret lathe work came later. The radio drill is a new addition to the shop. 
John spends many hours here. His pre-war job gone, he returned from World War II to open his own firm. Mrs. Rohner manages the office. She and John were married in 1938 and have four children. Mrs. Rohner finds time to serve as a den mother. In 1950, the local Boy Scout troop gave the town this statue. Each boy had to earn five dollars, which was contributed toward the erection of the statue. It is located on the grounds of the city hall. The Girl Scout organization provides leisure time opportunities for the girls to gain wider interests and become better citizens. The members of Troop 1 are enjoying themselves on the city hall grounds. They are in the traditional green and gold uniforms. Girls cannot become full-fledged scouts until they are 12 years old, so we have a group of younger girls called the Brownies. There are presently 20 girls in this group. Their activities include sewing, interior decorating, and much civic work. They strive for badges of merit and achievement, as do their older sisters. Recently, the West Liberty American Legion post furnished this hall for the Boy Scouts. It has ping pong, a woodwork shop, and other constructive equipment. Many hours are spent here. Each Boy Scout and his parents can be justly proud of the advances he is rewarded by the Board of Review. The friendly manner of Police Chief Paul Anderson has kept him active in the police department for over 20 years. Council meetings are held each week in the City Hall. Here, the members are discussing the West Liberty High School edition, their approval of the street widening project, and the merger of five school districts with their own. George Gordon, president of the Fair Board, and members of the Council are looking forward with great anticipation, hoping that this will be another successful event. City manager Waldo Myers is one of the most popular residents of the community. People are always welcome to visit him in his comfortably furnished office. His administration has been marked by capable officials, unity, and all around good government. The city hall bustles with all kinds of business, including offices of the Iowa State Highway Patrol. Sergeant Leonard Sims is leaving with a new recruit who must be specially trained to effectively fulfill the duties required of him. He will spend some time in training with his superior officer, after which he will be assigned to a territory. Due to its central location, West Liberty is the state headquarters. Founded in 1854, the Morris Department Store has been under the family's management for three generations. More quality for less money has always been the Morris policy, and it has been proven that the policy pays off in a multitude of good customers. The Morris store features this Frigidaire electric stove in its appliance department. It's the highlight of any kitchen. The store carries all the leading names in appliances. Here, Louis puts frozen food into the Cervelle. The store handles practically all necessities plus luxuries. Vincent Morris' son, Clarence, joined him in business in 1887. He took over complete operation 12 years later, adding a restaurant and grocery department. Since then, the C.W. Morris department store has passed into the hands of his son. The grocery department has grown to one of the leading food shopping centers in West Liberty stocking an excellent line of staples, meats, fresh fruits and vegetables, and canned goods. The customers always enjoy the store sales. Today's special was free chocolate milk also. Louis' only catastrophe was a fire in 1948, which completely destroyed the store and upstairs apartments. One of West Liberty's most active organizations is the Rotary Club. The goal of all members is to spend their lives being useful, helpful, and happy as good citizens, businessmen, and family men. They rise now to give thanks as President Robert Buckman signals with the gong. This prayer is a regular part of every Rotary meeting.
Mr. Kirkpatrick's office of treasurer of the club is well suited to him since he is president of the West Liberty Bank. We see him honoring Mr. McDermott, a former resident and guest of the day. West Liberty's Rotary Club was chartered January 27, 1925. Attorney Robert Brooke is one of the ten charter members living and active in the club today. Dr. Lester Rowe served as the first president. The student pictured is the representative chosen by the town's American Legion post to go to Hawkeye Boys State Camp. The Rotary also has an education fund for boys here and abroad. Attorney Brooke is leading the indoctrination services for three new members at this Rotary luncheon. Mr. Brooke's father, J. Loring Brooke, was a pioneer in the progress and development of West Liberty. We see the new members enjoy Mr. Brooke's explanation of the duties of good Rotarians and qualities which befit them, punctuality, human compassion, and good conduct. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? This is the four-way test, the Rotarian's way. These are the standards by which the lives of good Rotarians such as Tom Brooks are governed. Tom and his father, Claire Brooks, joined in partnership in the Brooks Oil Company in 1950. The company is equipped to serve the man on the farm or the customer who comes to the station. The firm maintains a high stock of Goodyear tires at all times. Thus, the customer is assured of the right tire when he needs it. The company offers tractor tire repair service on the farm as well as at the station. Bookkeeper Pete is the employee's favorite, for he takes care of the paychecks as well as the books. The office of the Brooks Oil Station is very attractive. Tom is in his work clothes talking to the Goodyear tire salesman. They are discussing the various types of tires in demand for tractors, implement tires, and many others. The station offers the authorized bare safety wheel alignment service, very important to all drivers, particularly those who are continually on the road. Tom does some of the work himself. Here we find him aligning a wheel for a customer. The wheel is turned in and out and the gauge reset to be sure there is perfect alignment in all positions. All four tires are checked in this manner. To balance the wheel on the balancing machine takes so little time and means so much. Mr. Brooks' association with the Texaco Distributing Company is one of the oldest in the state of Iowa. Tom and Claire are among the city's most popular businessmen. Fortunately, there is no age limit on the favorite pastime of American boys and men, the game of baseball. In our town, father and son play side by side, bringing into their lives a closer and warmer companionship. The Klein equipment team is warming up for the game. The girls softball team is all ready to go. With the bleachers packed to capacity every night, there's bound to be a lost key, someone who would appreciate a favor or some help. Cliff McIntyre is their man. There's a run to third base and another home run for the girls. They can be proud of their achievements with only one loss thus far this year. Girls on the team are from 14 to 40 years old. Their manager is Paul Anger. Andy Enderly announces the game from the speaker's box in back of home plate. Andy is manager of the boys team and a director of the board for ball. Four businesses volunteer to sponsor the teams. They are Ed Waite, Bob Carey, George Leonard, and Ivan Wolf. Our all-star players on the field are really out to get the $400 prize in the 4th of July tournament. Our all-star players are truly outstanding. Their suits are furnished by the merchants of West Liberty. There are 15 players on the all-star team roster. First baseman, Red Heath, really knows his business and he's out to win. 
The cheering of the crowd keeps the spirit of the players high, and the crowd has a wonderful time too, eating and drinking pop. The chief source of income is simply a free will offering at the games. Yes, this is our town, and we hope you've enjoyed this half hour spent in our city. Ours is a town that abounds with friendliness, going out to everyone who passes our way. West Liberty, Iowa, USA. This is our town.